12. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, writes, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But He disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the privilege of serving Jesus together. Um, Lord, thank you for what we have already experienced in our heart today through the music, the singing. Um, Lord, thank you for our church, what you're doing here. Lord, we recognize that um, time is getting by. Children are growing up. Another generation comes. I pray that we will so walk in a way that our footprints would be clearly visible for those who follow us. And that, Father, I pray that we might be faithful in our responsibility as parents, as grandparents, to influence the next generation in what is true and what is good. For we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we talked about the discipline of marriage. And it is a discipline. It's one of the chief tools that God uses in our lives to change us, to grow us, to mature us. He wants us to grow up. And you learn to do that, or you're supposed to learn that, through the process of marriage. Um, now, the other bookend of that would have to be parenting. If anything changes your life um, more than marriage, it would have to be parenting. Uh, it's, it's something that we don't actually ask for so much as is forced on us, that this relationship we have with these little people that God brings into our lives. I was there when my first child was born, and after that, who, who would ever want to go through that again? <laughs> um, I was kicked out at the second uh, birth of our second child because um, the cord was around his neck, and they had to dislocate his shoulder to get him out, and he weighed 11 pounds, 8 ounces. And so the third child, I said, call me when you're done. And... Um, <laughs> It's uh, something that um, we've gone through, and it's been an incredible journey, an incredible blessing. These, these, there's nothing like parenting that can be frustrating and fun, maybe sometimes even at the same time. <laughs> Challenging, humbling, and, um, you know, these, these little people come uh, very, very needy, don't they? They're needy little boogers that take, 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 and give absolutely zero in return. And yet, and yet, I mean, you know, materially speaking, and yet, we love them unconditionally. Why? Because they're ours. On loan from God, but they're ours. He has put them into our lives to help change us. 
to mold us, to teach us something about himself. And um, so Christian philosopher Elton Trueblood talks about this. And he talks about one of the best things that we can do for our children as parents is to love your marriage partner. Uh, it's got to be a priority. That's what we talked about last Sunday. It's got to be that way. Um, it's like this, what True Blood said, and let me quote him. He said this, A child needs to know that his father and mother are lovers, quite and apart from their relationship to him. It is the father's responsibility to make the child know that he is deeply in love with the child's mother. There is no good reason why all evidence of affection should be hidden or carried on in secret. A child who grows up with the realization that his parents are lovers has a wonderful basis for stability. I believe this is really, really true. So that's why last week we talked about marriage being a priority. Um, because here's, here's the deal. If it's, if it's not, then it has a tendency of making the spousal relationship, if you put the priority on the parent child relationship over the spousal relationship, it kind of turns the marriage relationship into a consumeristic thing where it's okay, you know, I'm pouring myself out for the sake of the kids. What are you going to do for me? So it's like, remember the difference between a covenantal relationship and a consumer relationship. In a consumer relationship, it's all about my needs. I put my personal needs above the importance of the relationship. But a, co a covenantal relationship is just the opposite. You sacrifice your own needs for the sake of the relationship. You put the relationship above your own needs. That's what happens a lot of times in parenting. We are, like I said, it's kind of a forced thing on us, but we sacrifice. And we don't really consider it a, a sacrifice because we love them and we're bonded with them. They're our children. However, remember, as we said last Sunday, we are not one flesh with them. They come and they go, but spouses are still there. So what happens a lot of times, if the children become the priority, then the spousal relationship often ends up running on empty. I think I've wondered about this sometimes when I see older couples out to dinner. And they have nothing to talk about. I've always wondered about that. I remember one time seeing an older couple sitting at a table. She looked out the window. And I don't think during the whole meal they said two words to each other. I wonder what happened, you know. And, of course, I don't know. Maybe they were madly in love and just didn't want to talk. I have no idea. But it makes me wonder that if we put all the emphasis and the priority and, and pour ourselves out for the sake of the kid to the neglect of the spousal relationship, I think that will eventually hurt the kids. You can't be to the kids what you need to be, and you can't be to your spouse what you need to be. So God wants us to keep that husband-wife relationship the priority. Now, as we talk about parenting today, you, you say, well, I'm not a parent. Well, you might uh, be in a position one day of uh, encouraging someone or praying for someone a little bit better, um, but I want to talk today about three things. It used to be four things. I changed it because I put the last two kind of together. But three things that every parent needs to know. And um, the authority for this, of course, is the Scripture. We look to the Scriptures as our authority. What does God have to say about it? And He has a lot to say all through the Bible about the responsibility of parents. You know, I was thinking as Anna was singing this morning and she mentioned, um, I see a generation rising up to take their place. And in my heart, I thought, oh, dear Lord, please let that happen. Let that happen. Um, the first thing you need to know as a parent is the destination. Do you, you have to know where you're going. You have to know what the goal is. What You have to understand what your job is as a parent, you don't want to end up receiving the Christopher Columbus Award. Do you know what that is? 
It, it's the, it's in dedicated. Here's what it reads. If you get the Christopher Columbus Award, the citation reads thus. In dedication to the parent who, like good old Christopher Columbus, didn't know where he was going. When he got there, didn't know where he was. And when he got back, didn't know where he had been. You don't want that, that award, right? So uh, what is the purpose? What is the end game in parenting? You know, you've probably heard me say before that the ultimate job of a parent is to work yourself out of a job. Well, let's get a little bit more specific because four times in the Bible you have Genesis um, 424 quoted, you know, for this cause, or 224, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they be, shall become one flesh. So five times in the Bible, we read about guy grows up, and he leaves. And he cleaves to his wife. And they do basically now what their parents did. So that gives us a clue as to what the goal of parenting is, to work yourself out of a job. It's not to... Let me, let me expound on this a little bit. Uh, the, it is not your job to raise, this is not just what you're supposed to do, to raise well-adjusted kids who feel good about themselves, who will be successful in the eyes of this world, who will be um, materially more successful than you were, uh, to be smart and well-behaved. Um, hopefully all of those things happen, but that is not the goal. That is not the goal. Here is the goal. Here's what parenting is. And I think I may have put this in your outline. Parenting is the process of teaching and training your children to love God and others, to leave your home in order to establish their own, and to live godly, productive lives for the glory of God. These uh, precious little takers come to us as arrows in the hand of a warrior to be shot out from the bow of God's grace out into the world to hit the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, to make sure that arrow is straight and flies true and is balanced. You need to know where you're going. And also, secondly, um, you need to know the directions how to get there. Once you know where you're going, okay, if my job is to raise my kids to know God, to love God, to love other people, and uh, to eventually establish their own family and live their lives for Jesus Christ, if that is my job, then what do I do? What are the directions? Well, a lot of the things that I'm going to say to you today, um, you probably already know. You've heard them before, but I think remembering these things is good for us. As Peter said, I'm, I'm trying to stir up your pure minds by putting you in remembrance of these things. And so a lot of these things are things you already know, but um, this, just consider this maybe as reinforcement. Now, there's a lot of material. This, this is one of those things where uh, if, you, if you're putting together a sermon on this, um, you gotta, you got to throw a lot of stuff out because you simply just don't have time for it. The, the reservoir of information out there on parenting, it's like an ocean. It's just so vast. So what we need to do is, uh, and what I hope to do, is kind of try to channel that knowledge so that the Holy Spirit can push it through the, the hydroelectric plants of our souls and give us the power to be the parents He wants us to be. Um, Now, here's the thing. There are four tasks that every parent has been given. And let me go over these things real quickly. Um, Number one, uh, or A, I guess, on on your outline, every parent should intentionally teach the truth to their kids. And when I say the truth, I mean the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, Uh, truth about life in general. Uh, This is something that the Bible makes perfectly clear. All through the Bible, it is the parent's responsibility to teach and train their children according to what is true, and in particular, what is true about God. 
Now, you can't, first of all, you can't pass on what you don't have. So you need to make sure that you have a relationship with God yourself. You need to make sure that you're born again, that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you are satisfied that you've done what the Bible says you have to do to be saved, to believe and trust in Jesus Christ alone and what He did for us on the cross as the payment for our sins and that He rose again from the dead. He is at the right hand of God as our great intercessor and you have trusted your life to Him. You understand that, okay? Well, there's a, there's a, there's a little mantra in the, in the world out there and a lot of Christians, unfortunately, have bought into it. And it's the kind of idea, well, I don't want to prejudice my children by teaching them what I think about God I would rather just let them grow up and make up their own minds about that. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I just think we ought to leave the options open for our kids. And, and if we do that, then their commitment will at least be authentic. Well, there are several problems with that. Number one, it's completely unbiblical. We are commanded in scriptures to teach our kids about God. And number two, another thing about them, if a, if a person says, well, now I don't want to force what I believe about God on my kids. Well, guess what? You're forcing it on them. You're communicating to them. Even if you're saying, I don't want to teach my kids a lot about God. I want to make up their... Well, you're teaching your kids a lot about God by not teaching them about God. You're teaching them he's not important. You're teaching them he's not making any difference in your own life. So it's not only unscriptural, it doesn't make sense not to teach your kids what you believe about God. And you know what? Since when does truth ever make someone close-minded or prejudiced? Jesus said, you shall know what? The truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. So by not teaching your children the truth, you are actually subjecting them to a life of bondage by embracing that which is not true. I think it's cruel not to give a kid what he most needs. So, it's your job to teach them the truth. Let me read a passage from the New Living Translation. I just like the way the New Living Translation said this. From Psalm 78, listen to what it says. We will not hide these truths from our children, but will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. We will tell of His power and the mighty miracles He did, for He issued His decree to Jacob. He gave His law to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. So the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, that they in turn might teach their children so each generation can set its hope anew on God, remembering His glorious miracles and obeying His commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Intentionally teach the truth to your kids on purpose. Use whatever daily interaction you have with them. You know, in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it talks about when you lie down, when you stand up, when you go for a walk, when you're away from home, when you're at home. You know, use, in other words, by your life and the circumstances in your life, be sensitive to those opportunities whether you're sitting at home or you're walking through the park, whatever, to use those situations to teach them about God. You're responsible. Secondly, that's task number one, teach them the truth. Secondly, authentically model your faith. Now, children learn what they live. Isn't that what? Dorothy Nolte said, uh, let, me, let me read that thing. I've, I've always loved this thing that she wrote. Um, and if you've not read this, I'm sure most of you have already read it, but I just think it's so good. And it, gives, it really causes you to think about stuff. Children learn what they live. 
If children learn with criticism, they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with fear, they learn to be apprehensive. If children live with pity, they learn to feel sorry for themselves. If children live with ridicule, they learn to feel shy. If children live with jealousy, they learn to feel envy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If children live with tolerance, they learn patience. If children live with praise, they learn appreciation. If children live with acceptance, they learn to love. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with recognition, they learn it is good to have a goal. If children live with sharing, they learn generosity. If children live with honesty, they learn truthfulness. If children live with fairness, they learn justice. If children live with kindness and consideration, they learn respect. If children live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and in those about them. And if children live with friendliness, they learn the world is a nice place in which to live. That gives you a lot of food for thought, doesn't it? Um, but children do. Some things are better caught than taught. Um, Dr. Grace Ketterman, I, I used to, um, in one of the college classes I used to teach, I used one of her books as a textbook, and that's how I got to know her. She's wrote, written a lot of books, particularly about raising kids and adolescents, and um, she's still alive, by the way. She's 93 years old, lives in Kansas. But um, in one of her books, she talks about her first impression of God. When as a little girl, she was thirsty and she got out of bed one night to go to the kitchen to get a drink of water. But she heard something in the kitchen, and so she quietly tiptoed, and she lived on a farm. Her dad was a farmer, and there was her dad on his knees, pouring out his heart for his kids and for his wife and family. She said, I was so struck by that. She said, as a little girl, all I could think of was how great God must be if my big, strong daddy needed him that much. Children learn what they live. You know, when I think about this, you know, I, I'm also reminded about, um, you know, uh, William and Catherine Booth, who started the Salvation Army. And you know what? Uh, they, they, they were, God bless them, they walked the talk. They didn't just talk the talk. They poured their lives into poor people. They did. They just poured their, you know what the Bible says, blessed are they that consider the, considers the poor. And so uh, William and Catherine Booth's kids followed in their footsteps. And William's uh, daughter, Evangeline Booth, who was one of the uh, uh, generals of the Salvation Army, when uh, she was an adult, but she said this about her parents. Very early, I saw my parents working for others, bearing their burdens day and night. They did not have to say a word to me about Christianity. <laughs> you know, we got to understand that we have to model our faith so in a thousand seemingly insignificant words, our phrases, our actions... Our attitudes, we're communicating something to our kids. Those little eyes are so perceptive, aren't they? And those little ears pick up on so much. You know, and I like that little poem that says, I'd rather see a sermon, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather you walk with me than merely point the way. The eyes a more ready pupil than ever was the ear. Advice can be confusing. Examples always clear. Model your faith. Then C, carefully navigate the stages. One thing that we all know about family is that it's, it's constantly changing, right? Families are always in a constant state of flux. Why? Because kids grow up and they change. They change from little precious kids into werewolves. When the full moon comes out, you know, then the fangs come out. No, but uh, there are stages, and you have to learn how to 
uh, navigate those stages. Now, uh, here's, here's a good way of thinking about it. The various stages of your kids' lives, think of it this way. When they're children, think of yourself as like a manager. Uh, and I say, when I say manager, I mean hands-on manager. Because you, you have to be hands-on with your kids, sometimes literally hands-on. But um, when, when the, they're little and you're managing their lives, you restrict their choices. Um, you provide a lot of structure for their lives. You limit what responsibilities they have based upon their abilities. Um, you know, and they need, at this particular stage, they need concrete rules. And you need to manage them. They need, uh, they need to know that you're the boss. They need to understand the meaning of the word no. Uh, you know, when I, when I think about that, I think about how many people sometimes get it different nowadays. I mean, how many kids, it, it seems like um, parents have lost the expectation that their children should obey them. It's, it, you know, but um, this is talking about when in the managing stage, this is where you have to employ discipline, especially as the kids are small and they're growing up. And I'm talking about corporal discipline. I'm not talking about abusing children or, you know, uh, that's, that has nothing to do with it. I mean, we, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But practice good, solid discipline. So here's, let me, there are three basic components of effective discipline. Let me give them to you real quick. This is not in your notes, but let me give them to you. These are three components of effective discipline. Number one. Clearly defined expectations and policies. That's what kids, kids need to know what is expected of them. As a manager, if you manage a business or if you're the boss, your employees need to know what you expect from them. And if you're a good boss, they do. They know exactly what, the want, the, what you want. They know exactly how to please you, how to do their job, because you have you probably have a policy and procedure manuals that tells you them what is expected of them. So little kids need to know what mom and dad expect by putting down clearly defined rules. This is what you should do. This is what you should not do. This is a rule in our house. We do this. We do not do this. So you have clearly defined expectations and policies. That's component number one. Component number two is probably maybe... They're all equally important, but principle number two is discipline through a previously stated process. You say, well, Paul, what do you, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. You have the lines drawn, clearly defined rules and regulations and policies and expectations. They know what is expected of them. They see the line. So discipline by previously stated process means they also know what happens if they cross the line. So mom and dad have drawn this line and said, this is what we expect. And not only do we want you to know what we expect and what we want and what will please us and what, you know, this is for your own good, but, it, but here's what's going to happen if you cross this line. So here's the line. This is what we expect. If you cross it, this is what's going to happen so that they know what's going to happen if they cross the line. And <laughs> how they will test you on that point. Oh, will it really happen? Let's see if it will really happen. That's why I always am amazed that, you know, I heard a parent at a store tell her, her child to do something. She said, if you, don't, if you do that one more time, I'm going to get a, you're going to get a spanking or something. She said something like that. And the kid did it again. And the parent did what? Nothing. She repeated what she had said previously. Didn't you hear what I said, that if you did that again, I would spank you? And that went on and on and on. So what, they, what is the kid learning? My mom's a moron. I don't know. I don't know what they're learning, but you draw the line, and the kids know what happens when they cross over that line. And then the third component of effective discipline is consistency and follow-through. 
This is what happens when you cross the line the first time. It also happens when you cross the line the second time. Oh, by the way, if you cross it a third time, same thing's going to happen. Oh, oh, we're on num- how many number? 1,487. Oh, again, this is what's going to happen every time you cross the line. This is what happened. You say, wow, that, this thing, parenting, sounds like a lot of work. It is. It's never easy. Now, I'm th- thinking about, you know, this thing about discipline. Uh, kids in childhood need to know you're the manager. Just like Abraham's kids. We talked about Abraham in our Sunday school class today. Here's what God said about Abraham. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household or his family after him to keep the way of the Lord. So part of Abraham's choice as being the archetype of faith and salvation in Jesus Christ is that God knew, well, he'll keep his children. I'm, cho- I'm choosing him because I know he's going to teach his kids what's true about me. That's an incredible statement. So in childhood, think of yourself as a manager. Then we go to the adolescence when they... Kids hit puberty and they, their body starts changing and the hormones kick in and they cross that bridge from childhood to adulthood, which is called, we call it today, adolescence. So um, think of your role in this stage more like a coach. Now, um, you're still the boss, but uh, you broaden their choices a little bit and you increase their responsibilities. They're getting older. You teach them. That's what a coach does. A coach teaches. He trains. He conditions. He uh, he encourages. He challenges. He trains. And sometimes, if you've played uh, sports like I did growing up, uh, boy, when I grew up, I played football for eight years. Uh, I want to tell you, we always respected our coaches, whatever they wanted to do. Whatever they told us to do, we would do it. It was amazing. I mean, when I was in high school, one day Coach Pickett came out there and says, Andrews, your hair's too long. I didn't, he, before he had said the next word, I was running to the locker room and I buzzed my head off, cut my hair off. Why? Coach said to. I admired him, wanted to win, wanted to play. So coaches, you know, they're, they're along the sidelines training you, trying to get the best out of you and encouraging you and challenge you to do better. That's what a coach does. That's one of the main things kids need in adolescence. And then they get to become adults, which is really a beautiful thing. When you watch your kids grow up and they become adolescents and you can become, you know, you've got like this coach relationship with them and you're you're there to give them advice and to coach them and encourage them and to show them things and teach them things. And then they become adults. And one of the scary things that, you know, one of the, and I've told this to parents before, there comes a point, and I don't know where it's going to come for you, but I, it, it's kind of a blurry line, but we go through this line, and it's when, as a parent, you now have to let go. And you have to trust your kids' own choices. That's kind of hard. Because it's almost like, well, you're kind of done, but you're not done. But you kind of are done. You've, you've, done, you're, you've done your best. That you've, uh, you've crossed the bridge of adolescence without jumping off of it. So, okay, so you're, you're, okay your kids grow up, and then they leave. And they're out there on their own, and they make their own choices. And, hey, you have to live with it. And you just hope and pray they'll make the right choices. Now, think of yourself when your kids go through adolescence and they become adults. Think of yourself now in terms, not as a manager, not as a coach, but as a consultant. That you're there now for counsel. You're free to give them advice. And, of course, your own encouragement. You continue to encourage them, to love them to uh, give them advice and pray for them. you All the way through this thing, you are praying for them. So what you don't want to do in these different stages of uh, navigating the stages, being the manager when they're small, being the coach 
when they're going through adolescence, being the consultants once they become adults. One of the things you do, you don't want to get those stages mixed up because some parents do that. They act as a consultant for a five-year-old. Or, you know, they try to reason with a little kid, uh, you know, when the kid needs to just obey. I don't know, you know, your little kid, it's time to go to bed. Why? Why do I need to go to bed? I don't want to go to bed. It's not about what they want. You're the boss. You've told them to go to bed. You don't owe them an explanation about when they go to bed. They just go to bed. Why? Because you're the boss. You don't let them dictate the rules in your home. Not unless you want to get your heart broken. You don't do that. If you don't break their will, you'll, they'll break your heart. That's the way it goes. I'm not talking about crushing their spirit. I'm talking about breaking their will. And I mean that with all of my heart. If you don't break their will, they will break your heart. Uh. Okay. The directions. It's in the Word of God. Follow the directions. Know where you're going. Know how to get there. You got to be you got to be the manager, you got to be the coach, you got to be the consultant. Then last of all, the discipline. Know what it's going to cost you. Because evidently, as you could tell, some of these things are going to be costly. And especially in this day and age, when the forces arrayed, arrayed against the Christian family are massive and relentless. And you have to understand that as a parent, you are in a spiritual battle. Satan is after your kids. If you did not know that, this is your wake-up call. Satan is after your kids. Now, um, yeah, I, you know, there's so much I could, I could take a number of different rabbit trails here, and I know you're praying that I don't. But, uh, you know, you think about the music industry that, uh, you know, uh, MTV identifies itself, its own description of itself as a cultural force to basically exert control over the younger generation. It, that's, they, they say that. Um, you know, television and movie industry, um, the Internet, um, you know, all of these things are preaching a secular view of life about identity, about sexuality, about relationships. And you've got to counter all that. You've got to protect your kids from that. So, and, and knowing what it was, will cost, okay, first of all, you got to avoid the pitfalls. There are certain pitfalls that every parent needs to avoid. If you have more than one child, you have to avoid the pitfall of favoritism. The Bible, should, you know, when you think about um, Jacob and Esau, you know, and um, Joseph and his brothers, you know, the sibling rivalry, you know, that's fostered by... Uh, favoring one child over another. You, you know, you don't want to do that. You know, I, I uh, this past year I finished reading William Manchester's huge three-volume set on the life of uh, Winston Churchill. A great man. Uh, some people say he's, he's the man that saved Western civilization. He was the guy that for 11 years preached against the evil of Nazi Germany and what Hitler was. He, he was like the only man on the planet that knew what Hitler was. And he, he was alone in that and uh, hated for 11 years before the world woke up to what Hitler really, really was. But it's hard to, I don't know when you, I read that and read some of the things that Churchill said, I'm not convinced that he was a believer. I'm not, not sure he was a Christian. Say, well, why is that? Well, here's what he said, his own words. He, he said this. He said, my father was like God, busy elsewhere. That was his picture of God. And granted, Randolph Churchill was an evil man. He was an evil, womanizing father who had no time for his son, though his son begged him in tears to visit him when he sent him off to boarding school. You could read some of the letters from Churchill 
as a little boy begging his mom and dad to come see him, and they never did. Didn't have time for him. He said it. He, he knew that. He knew his father did not like him. His father did not like the way he looked. His father didn't like the way he sounded. He didn't want to be in the same room with his own son. And Churchill, though he grew up to be a great man, I'm not sure that he knew God. What shaped his view of God? And then his own father, Randolph, died in agony with a sexually translated, uh, uh, tr uh, transmitted disease. He died of syphilis in agony, losing his mind. So, you know, the impact of our lives, we have to avoid the pitfalls of, of favoritism, of inconsistency, of criticism. Oh, when we criticize. Avoid those pitfalls. And then make the investment. Now, um, it means investing your time intentionally, investing your life into the life of your children. It takes time to do that. It takes effort to do that. You've got to know your kids. You've got to know who their friends are. You have to uh, monitor their cerebral input. You have to know what they're reading, what they're looking at. Monitor their internet. You have to do all of these things, and it takes time. You have to be informed. You know, there are a number of great books. Um, you know, um, if you have little children, uh, uh, Ted Tripp's book, Shepherding a Child's Heart, wonderful book. Um, then his book, Paul Tripp, wrote a book about raising teenagers called Age of Opportunity. Uh, great books. Uh, Russell Moore and another guy co-authored a book about uh, bringing up child children in, in this secular age. And I can't remember the name of it, but it's by Russell Moore. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book about raising kids. There are so many uh, books out there. You say, so, well, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, don't, I don't, uh, can't teach my kid about God or Bible because I don't know much about it myself. It's never too late to start learning. You need a plan. You need to take the time. You need a plan. It's not going to happen by accident. And by the way, just so I can throw this in here, it's not the church's job to raise your kids. The church is here to reinforce the values and principles and morals you impart to your kids at home so that they can come to Sunday school and learn from another adult what you're teaching them at home. Pity the child that all they get from uh, what they learn about God is what they learn when they come to church for maybe an hour or two a week. You know, uh, you need the church, not as a substitute, but as a reinforcement to what you're training your kids at home. And you need the Lord. You need the Lord. You need to intercede for your kids. You need to sweat for their souls. You know, parents often make two mistakes. Here are a couple of mistakes parents often make. Number one, they take too much blame for their children's failures and problems. And then the second mistake is they took too much credit for their kids' uh, accomplishments and successes. You know what's going to prevent you from both mistakes? An understanding of God's grace. You know, um, I thank God for our kids. I thank God that all our kids know Jesus. We started pounding that into them as, as little kids. You know, they, they would hear us pray over them. You know, oh, Lord, I pray that our kids would come to know Jesus at an early age. You know what's kind of funny about that? One time, one of our kids wanted to say the blessing and they pray for their grandparents to be saved at an early age. <laughs> they just heard that so much. One of our kids, one night, we went to bed, and we were tired, and so we didn't go through our nightly ritual. 
until we heard a little voice. Read the Bible, Daddy. Read the Bible, Daddy. I didn't do it that night. So guess what we did? Tired or not, you get up and read the Bible and pray. It's not the church's job. A parent has got to sweat and bleed for their kids. By the grace of God, we're saved by grace. We serve by grace. We have to raise our kids by the grace of God. Do the best we can by His grace and trust Him for their future. That's all we can do. You know, don't miss the close connection that exists between teaching your children about God and teaching them to obey you as His representatives. Please don't make that mistake. Don't fail to connect that, those two things together. What you're teaching them about God is directly connected to what you're teaching them about obeying you as God's representative. Because if they don't respect you, chances are they're not going to fear the Lord. And the psalmist, or rather Solomon said in Proverbs 23, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he who fathers a wild, wise child, not a wild child. <laughs> I was a wild child. Not, you don't want that. A father who fathers a wise child shall have joy in him. Your father and your mother shall be glad, and she who bore you will rejoice. Yeah, that, it's, it's going to cost you. You've got, you've, got to, um, you've got to discipline your kids. Noth look, look, let me ask you this. What has changed in the nature of children, all of a sudden that makes the Bible irrelevant. I want you to think about that. What, what has changed all of a sudden that makes what the Bible says about raising children no longer relevant? <laughs> like this, here's, these things are no longer relevant in today's society. Uh, Proverbs 13, 24, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son while there's hope. Do not set your heart on his destruction. Proverbs 22, 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it from him. Proverbs 23, 13, do not hold, withhold discipline from your child. If you strike him with the rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from hell. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Dis discipline your son and he will give rest. Yes, he will give delight to your heart. Oh, but pff, what, are you, what are you? You from another planet or something? You, mean, you actually think that's true? You think people do that anymore? I think they better. You, we don't get smarter than God. And if this is the Word of God, we better follow it. Loving discipline. Clearly defined rules and expectations. Discipline by a previously stated process and being consistent. And God says, you'll save, it. You'll, you'll save his soul from hell. You know, I remember the day my dad with a broken heart, after God in His mercy and grace reconciled us because He was rough on us boys. And He said to me, I'm sorry. I did the best I could. Did He mess up? Oh, yeah, yeah, He did. Because anger begets anger. And He was an angry man and I became an angry son, which is why I told Him to go to hell when I went out, walked out the door that day and lived on the street for a month. I despised him. I wanted him dead. I could have cared less. That's how much I hated my father. 
And it's no wonder that I ran from the Lord for years and years. But in the mercy and grace of God, He brought us together and reconciled us. And then I got to the place where I couldn't even get around Him anymore without Him hugging me and telling me how much He loved me. I, I was 17 years old when I remember the first time Daddy said he loved me. I was 17. 17 years old. But then I knew, I've, then I learned a lot about how Daddy was raised. Look, here, here's, here's what's at stake. Let's take our Bibles in closing and go to Judges chapter 2. Because this is, folks, this is what we can't let happen. Go to the book of Judges, chapter 2. And um, this is, look, look, this is what happened to Israel. And the same thing can happen to us as parents. In Joshua, in jo I'm sorry, Judges. I might have said Joshua. I meant Judges, chapter 2, verse 6. Joshua dismissed the people, and they each went to their inheritance to take possession of the land. Okay, so they're through the wilderness wanderings. They're entering the promised land. And it says in verse 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And then look at verse 10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And then it says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And then it says in verse 14, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. You know what I'm wondering? I'm wondering if we're seeing a generation that's being plundered by the devil. Robbed and every good thing being torn away from them. It's up to mom and dad. So today, are you a consultant? Are you a coach? Are you a manager? Whatever. We've got a job to do, don't we? You say, oh, all my kids are grown. You know, well, just make it your business then, as the Bible talks about in Timothy, for the elders to teach the younger. To share the knowledge you have about raising kids with those who are raising kids now, though you're already done with that. Encourage one another. Let's stand together for prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for the families of our church. Lord, I thank you for our kids, our young people. Lord, I, I pray you might set a hedge of protection about us. And yet, even then, I pray that you would give us the spiritual fortitude of doing the hard stuff when it comes to being the parent that our kid needs us to be. Lord, for that parent with a broken heart today, may your grace be poured into their hearts and to, to continue to hope in you and in your grace. Lord, you are merciful and kind and gracious. And Lord, there, I know in my heart there was a time in my own life when people would have looked at me as a hopeless case. And yet you brought me back to yourself. And Father, I pray for that parent who's struggling. I pray for that parent who might need to make amends and say, you know, I've not been doing a very good job and I need to do better. And by the grace of God, this is what I'm going to do. Father, empower them by your Holy Spirit to follow through on that. Lord, I pray that every couple here today would love each other and communicate their love for one another to their children, that their children might have that wonderful 
foundation of security and stability by knowing mom and dad are in love. Before I close my prayer, let me just say this, that the, the best parent is the parent that knows Jesus as Lord and Savior. So if you don't know Christ today, I would urge you to give your heart and life to Him. And if that's something you want to talk about, we're here. We want to help you. God loves you. Jesus died on that cross for your sins. If you're willing to turn to Him by faith and put your trust in Him, He will save you. The best parent is the parent that knows Jesus and follows Jesus. And so, Father, as we go our separate ways, I pray for our families. I pray for moms and dads here today that they might be encouraged, that nobody feels guilty or beat up over this. Lord, just help us to realize that you love us and that you will give us grace and help us in our time of need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Go be the church.